This week's episode of Tech News Day is sponsored by Stitch Fix and by ExpressVPN. And nowadays, trying to keep track of every terrible, troubling thing happening in the world can be a bit overwhelming. So it's understandable that a lot of people simply tune out the news entirely or maintain a surface level understanding of things by just scrolling past those headlines. I got it. <laughs> I read the headline. Or maybe if you are interested in staying informed, but for whatever reason, legitimate or otherwise, you do not care for mainstream news outlets, you instead get your news right here on YouTube.com. I mean, it's what we do, the news. Yes. A lot of you have commented or tweeted at us about how this channel is your primary source of news information, which... Uh, that and Listen, uh, that's not great. I mean, we, re we, we really appreciate it. But don't do that. We, you have to have other sources. I mean, obviously, keep liking, commenting, subscribing, smash that bell. But for the love of God, do not rely on this channel as your primary source of information about what is happening in the world. That is a caution that we are reading for you right now. And it's insane for you to do that. Now, for one thing, what we do here, it barely even qualifies as news. We're kind of just reading actual news articles and then summarizing them, commentating on them, and giving you a uh, kind of boiled down version of it. We are also, uh, we're also being unashamedly biased and opinionated when we do so. We're not yeah. journalists. Guilty. And neither are most YouTube channels focused on news. And nevertheless, according to a recent study, a lot of teenagers, they're getting their primary source of news from YouTube and YouTube influencers, and that's troubling. Yeah, so this study was sponsored by the nonprofit organization Common Sense Media and conducted via online surveys through SurveyMonkey of around 1,000 respondents. And before we do look at the results, I, I want to point out that while a lot of this supports the idea that the teens don't have very good media literacy, I think the same is probably true for most Americans in general, regardless of their age. I mean, all you got to do is go look at any Facebook comment section for literally anything. Mm -hmm. Ignorance knows no boundaries. Mm -hmm. For the question in the survey, my knowledge of current events is primarily informed by 33% said so people I know in the real world, such as friends, family, or teachers. 31% said personalities, influencers, and celebrities I follow on social media or YouTube. And another 31% said news organizations. So you've got a pretty even three-way split there between word of mouth influencers and traditional news when it comes to respondents primary source of news. Yeah, but when asked how often they get their news from YouTube, 65% of respondents said at least once a week, with 23% of those respondents saying they get their news from YouTube every day. It's every day, bro. <laughs> of course, YouTube is home to all sorts of legitimate news outlets, but when asked when you get your news on YouTube, are you more likely to get it from celebrities, influencers, and personalities, or from news organizations, 60% answered celebrities, influencers, and personalities compared to just 39% who answered news organizations. And the same was true for social media. 58% said that when they get their news on Facebook or Twitter, it's from celebrities, influencers, and personalities, as opposed to 41% who said news organizations. Personally, I only trust Crank T. Nelson and Pixelated Boat. Those are my two main sources of news on Twitter. And yeah, smash that bell, get those tweets. Yes. Now you know what's happening in the world. Mm -hmm. Done and done. Yes. But uh, That's not a slight against them. I love both of those accounts. I'm just saying I love their takes on the news. Great takes. Yes. The hottest. Uh, probably the most troubling answers in this survey, though, were in response to the question, how do you most often find news on YouTube? 27% said that they sub to specific channels, much like many of you have subbed to this channel. Thank you. Right? But 50% uh, said that it's just whatever shows up next in the recommendation algorithm, which is a big yikes considering yeah. how it's been demonstrated repeatedly that YouTube's recommendation algorithm is just bad in general, but it also has a bad habit of pushing people down ideological rabbit holes a bit. Yeah. But hey, on the bright side, the responses to this next question were kind of reassuring. Whether you get your news from them or not, do you think news from celebrities, influencers, or personalities who share content on YouTube or social media sites like Facebook or Twitter generally get the facts straight? Or do you think these stories and reports are often inaccurate? 61% said the stories are often inaccurate. Only 38% said that they get the facts straight. But eh, you think about it and you're like, maybe those 61%, maybe those they're like, well, my YouTube influencer is always correct, of course. But all of those other YouTube influencers are wrong. So I'm going to say, in general, wrong. But... I still choose to believe my influencers. I think there's a good portion of these people that are watching videos that they may or may not agree with just to leave a comment saying that they have a different opinion on what the news is yeah. compared to what people it's are saying. It's an American saying. pastime. Yes. 
Yeah. Contrarianism gets, gets is, the uh, blood. It's a good. Russian. <laughs> uh, anyways, some other interesting insight with this whole thing. Teens, they are not too big on podcasts. Nope. <laughs> uh, which might explain why we aren't doing as well as, you know, we wish we were. Tell a friend. Sorry, Ira Glass. <laughs> no teens listening to your podcast. Uh, especially news podcasts. Yeah. Teens do not like news podcasts. Nope. Only 22% said that they get their news from podcasts at least once a week, with just 4% saying they do every day. Meanwhile, we need to get on TikTok. We need to do the news on... T- I'm not. I'm kidding. We're not going to get on there. Uh, 60% of teens, uh, they say they never get their news from podcasts. But anyway, speaking of the mediums that teens aren't super into, television. Wow. 49% of teens said they uh, watch TV news at least once a week, with a whole whopping 23% saying they never watch TV news. Sorry, Rachel Maddow. Get out of here, Hannity. Uh, anyways, like we said before, uh, aside from the more specific aspects of this study, the takeaway here shouldn't be that teens are terribly uninformed, because that's a problem that spans all generations. Also, a whole lot of traditional TV news nowadays, especially on Fox, is uh, about as worthless as anything you'd find on YouTube. So... It's not like traditional media in this country is all that great to begin with. Yeah, I mean, I'd put Tucker Carlson's show up against the most just, like, shitty reactionary statue of a Roman emperor uh, commenter on YouTube any day. Hard to say who is better or worse. Yeah, but hey, if these survey results uh, still make you worry for the future, only 25% of these respondents say they'll be eligible to vote in the 2020 election. Oh, well, then who cares? Yes. I Personally, I am ready for the roaring 20s. Let's bring back the mafia, baby. And the, and the, certainly a depression will happen at some point. Oh, that too. Yes. Well, hopefully they But don't... they have the fun dances. I hope they don't ban alcohol. Oof. Well, they might. I need, I need my boobs. Yeah. Anyway, as for whether YouTubers and other influencers shaping the minds of young people is a bad thing, I don't know. Probably not great. <laughs> but the solution isn't just more traditional media. You're not going to shove a newspaper in a teenager's face. Get this out of here. <laughs> What is this? How do I scroll? <laughs> now, the solution is more media literacy in general. It's about learning to recognize bias, whether it's overt bias or something more subtle like conflicts of interest. If you're reading about Amazon and the Washington Post, maybe don't. Maybe read it about it in a different newspaper. Grain of salt, please. Yeah. Yes. Um, yeah, bias doesn't necessarily invalidate news, but it should be taken into account. Um, You also should probably know the difference between news and editorials, because a lot of people don't. A big problem when someone gets very angry about a news article. The New York Times is just so biased. It's like, yeah, it's the fucking opinion page. You're reading an opinion article, not their news section. It's completely different. Please, it's clearly labeled. Yes. At least in a a physical newspaper, it is clearly labeled. Online, Uh, I can kind of understand. It's like news slash tag slash opinion. It's on purpose done like that so to rile people up and get clicks that is true which is another problem the news <laughs> is monetized they're they're not doing much to fight up against like ignorance yes they're embracing it mm-hmm. um, much like our thumbnails we need you to click yeah, yeah. also here's a good thing actually uh, read primary sources instead of just uh, secondhand articles or uh, YouTube commentary videos that talk about those we sources. leave our links in the description for you they're down there mm-hmm and also, in a lot of cases, YouTube and social media can be great for helping figure out all this stuff because the platforms are full of a lot of smart people with expert knowledge on all sorts of topics, and they've got the sources to back it up. You just got to, you know, just have a keen eye. Mm-hmm. You got to be skeptical enough that you can spot the difference between a, a smart person and a person who's just good at seeming smart. Yes. That can be hard, but, like, I'm not going to say social media and YouTube are bad for people understanding the news. They can be great. Mm-hmm. They can also be terrible. Yes. Is there a line where it's uh, worse being more informed about something, but maybe having a little bit of inaccuracy versus not knowing anything at all? I have no fucking idea. We try to do our best job here. Yeah. But obviously, we are opinionated and biased, so... I mean, we've recorded this entire video already, but... This is the second time we've SD done it. The SD card ran out of space. So, like, just keep that in mind on whether we're, like... A reliable source on literally anything. I'm exhausted right now. It's been very <laughs> hot. Remember how we've been recording and it's been very hot? Well, we had to do this video twice, so I'm very hot right now. Woo! Now, in the <laughs> essence of time, let's move on. Uh, another thing to be very skeptical about in today's media landscape are state-run media outlets and also the fact that governments around the world are increasingly using troll farms to spread pro-regime narratives on social media in ways that are difficult 
or impossible to detect. The biggest example of that kind of thing was, of course, Russia's Internet Research Agency, which used social media accounts to sway public opinion and lead up to the 2016 election. That was not uh, not only successful at its original aims, but also at making loads of people now assume that anyone who disagrees with them is just an online Russian to- troll. Yeah, I love that. No. Yeah. Love that. Yeah. <laughs> Anyways, it's not just Russia doing this sort of thing. The same sort of digital disinformation campaign is currently being conducted on behalf of the Chinese government, who you may have noticed are having some issues with uh, Hong Kong lately. Oh, hmm. what could that be? Hmm. Yeah, if you haven't been paying attention to what's happening in Hong Kong, and who can blame you? No. The, the short answer is that Hong Kong was a British territory for a very long time. When the British gave Hong Kong back to the People's Republic of China in 97, the terms of the deal included preserving Hong Kong's existing legal system and civil rights for at least the next 50 years, making Hong Kong semi-autonomous despite being technically Chinese territory. Compared to the rest of China, Hong Kong citizens generally enjoy a lot more personal freedom. But despite the 2047 expiration date on fun, China isn't waiting until then to impose their mainland rules. Ironic because 2047 is, I think, the end of fun for everyone on Earth. No, it'll be is, cyberpunk. We'll is, be no, isn't that when it's supposed to have, uh, when, when global warming is supposed to actually just burn us all alive? That's true. Well, who cares? Fuck it. <laughs> uh, the current situation over there stems from a murder case where a Hong Kong man admitted to murdering his girlfriend while they were on vacation in Taiwan. Because the murder happened in Taiwan and Hong Kong and Taiwan have no extradition treaty, Hong Kong authorities couldn't actually prosecute the case. So, Hong Kong's government proposed an extradition treaty with Taiwan But because there's enough pro-China influence in Hong Kong's government, they use this as a perfect opportunity to bundle that Taiwan extradition agreement with a similar extradition agreement with mainland China. So this new law allowing an admitted murderer to be sent to Taiwan would also allow basically anyone critical of the Chinese government to be transferred to the mainland and be prosecuted for that. This is understandably not popular. uh, It's not a popular idea in Hong Kong, and that's why there's lots of protests. And lasers. Mm-hmm. It's a light show every night in Hong Kong. How could anyone be mad? It's it's crazy. It's, yeah. Yeah, yeah. It's, it's fucking wild. And uh, how it ends is anybody's guess. Uh, yeah. It's up to the actress from Mulan to decide how this ends. Well, he's, she's made her decision. Yes. And uh, she, is, she, she is supporting the regime. Mm-hmm. But also she kind of has to or else she'd probably lose all of her work. Yes. If, you, uh, if, you wanna, if you're as old as us and you want to ruin uh, your childhood... Go ahead and look into Jackie Chan. Yeah. Uh, a man who not is great. a fantastic stunt actor and comedic actor. Yeah, but a, a modern day uh, Buster Keaton with punches and kicks. Got to give him credit for that. Perhaps the greatest stunt man in cinema history. But also kind of an asshole. a huge shill for the Chinese government. Possibly a womanizer and a bad dad. He mm-hmm. betrayed his own son. Mm-hmm. Anyways, while coverage of these protests in Western media has certainly been Uh, biased, in the sense that being pro-civil rights is a biased, Uh, coverage out of China has, of course, been very biased in the opposite direction, in the pro-China direction, painting the protesters as dangerous, as a violent mob. And the state-run news coverage isn't just meant for the people of China. It's also trying to sway public opinion worldwide. Why else would Chinese news agencies have accounts on sites like Twitter and Facebook, which are banned in China, and be paying for their posts to be shown as ads? It's not for fun. Well, much to China's displeasure, Uh, Both of those websites are now starting to push back on this. Twitter has suspended ad privileges for all state-controlled news outlets across the board. But uh, Facebook announced that they're still going to allow it. Hey, why don't you come over here? We looked into it and we're like, "Uh, I don't know. I mean, on the one hand, yes, this this is literally what happened on our website less than three years ago. But on the other hand, hand, this is almost 200,000 accounts that are going to need some place to spend their money. Yeah. And why is there 200,000 like accounts money. ready to spend their money, Elliot? Yeah, Twitter has shut down around 200,000 uh, accounts that are believed to be Chinese government sock puppets. In other words, they're like, normal user here telling you about how the Chinese government's actually right this time, guys. Mm-hmm. Um, so Twitter, they shut down 200,000 of those. Uh, Facebook has only removed five accounts, seven pages, and three groups, all of which was based on information that Twitter helpfully shared with them. Twitter was, did their whole investigation, and they're like, hey, Mark would probably... Uh, Probably could use some of this information. Here you go, Mark. We're trying to run a business here. (laughs) Yeah. Uh, So, yeah, you compare the two companies, neither of which I love, but it would appear that Twitter is taking this sort of thing a hell of a lot more seriously than Facebook is, which should be very concerning, considering how the last U.S. election went and the fact that the next one's just 15 months away. Well, the Zuck's going to Zuck. Fool me once. Shame on me. (laughs) Fool me twice. 
No, I won't get fooled again. <laughs> Anyways, before we get into more news, it's time for a break and uh, to talk to you about our sponsors. Uh, this episode is sponsored by Stitch Fix. Personal style is like a fingerprint. Everyone has their own. And whatever your style, the expert styles at Stitch Fix are ready to help you express yourself. Stitch Fix is an online personal styling service that delivers your favorite clothing brands right to your door. To get started, go to stitchfix.com newsday, answer some questions about your preferred style, and your personal shopper will ship you a box of clothes, shoes, and accessories. You don't have to do anything. Lean back. Yes. Get comfy. There's no commitment required, and you only pay for what you keep. Shipping, exchanges, and returns are always free. Plus, the $20 styling fee is automatically applied towards anything you keep from your box. You'll never have to worry again about looking good with Stitch Fix. Get started today at stitchfix.com newsday and get an extra 25% off when you keep everything in your box. That is stitchfix.com newsday. And... Appropriately enough, this episode is sponsored by ExpressVPN. Mm. If, you're, yeah, if you're in China, you're going to want this. <laughs> yeah, you should probably check this out, especially if you're in China. If you, or if you're traveling abroad this summer, there's going to be a lot of things on your checklist to pack. Mm -hmm. But what's probably missing is the one app that's going to keep you safe and secure online while you're away, ExpressVPN. ExpressVPN doesn't just encrypt your data while you surf the internet on public airport and hotel Wi-Fi. It even lets you stream and access content that normally would have been blocked in that country. You know, Twitter, social media things that a certain country you might be in might not want you to have access to. Ooh. Well, with ExpressVPN, you can unblock all of your favorite websites and have access to the internet just like you would when you're at home, regardless. ExpressVPN runs in the background of your computer or phone, and then you use the internet just like you normally would. You download the app, you click to connect, and voila, you are protected now. ExpressVPN is fast as hell, it costs less than $7 a month, and it comes with a 30-day money-back guarantee. ExpressVPN uses new, cutting-edge technology called Trusted Server to make sure there's no logs of what you do online. It's time to stop the hackers, time to stop Big Brother, and the big internet companies from grabbing up all your data. Take back your online privacy with ExpressVPN. Protect your online activity today and find out how you can get three months free at expressvpn.com newsday. That's E-X-P-R-E-S-S-V-P-N dot com slash Newsday for three months free with a one-year package. Visit ExpressVPN dot com slash Newsday to learn more. All right. Well, uh, let's look at some YouTube news. They are being sued. This isn't the first time. Objection. It, it won't be the last time. No. But uh, they're also doing some suing themselves. They might be in the right on that one. Yeah. But let's start with the first one first. If you follow any YouTube creators who identify as LGBTQ and who make videos about those topics, you're probably aware that they get demonetized and age-restricted all the damn time for it. It's been happening for a while, and it's largely thanks to YouTube's idiotic algorithm, which, you know, that algorithm has trained itself to see words like gay or transgender in video titles, descriptions, and tags, and just assume that the video is probably too controversial for advertising or recommendations. Well, a group of LGBTQ YouTubers is now suing YouTube for discrimination. According to the lawsuit, quote, YouTube is engaged in discriminatory, anti-competitive, and unlawful conduct that harms a protected class of persons under California law. Additionally, it says that YouTube's, quote, control and regulation of speech on YouTube has resulted in a chaotic cesspool where popular, compliant, top quality, and protected LGBTQ plus content is restricted, stigmatized, and demonetized as shocking, inappropriate, offensive, and sexually explicit, while homophobic and racist hate mongers run wild and are free to post vile and obscene content. They really should change the, the tag at the top of YouTube. It should go from broadcast yourself to hate-filled cesspool. Hate-filled cesspool. <laughs> Now, of course, YouTube denies this, claiming LGBTQ terms don't automatically get videos flagged. And CEO Susan said last week, there's no policy to say if you put certain words in a title, that will be demonetized. We work incredibly hard to make sure that when our machines learn something, because a lot of our decisions are made algorithmically, that our machines are fair. There shouldn't be any automatic demonetization, which, uh, Susan... I don't know, because we've definitely had videos that uh, immediately upon upload are yeah, demonetized. This doesn't really scan with my experience. She also claimed that the recommendation algorithm and the demonetization algorithm work entirely independent of each other. Oh, so they must just both arrive at the exact same conclusions about everything. Within because, seconds. <laughs> because every demonetized video we've ever made also doesn't uh, get recommended. gets much fewer reviews, almost no. as if it's being recommended less. Well, but okay. So yeah, if this ever makes it to court, it will be really interesting to see what happens. Uh, YouTube and every other social platform gets accused of discrimination and bias from all sides constantly. But it's a lot more serious when the supposed victims of that discrimination are legally considered a protected class. Uh, so it'll also be interesting to see if and how YouTube places the blame for all of this on their algorithm. And to see how algor algorithmic bias gets treated in court, because that's not a subject with a whole lot of legal precedent. How Ro much Robot jail. Yeah. It's the robot, sir. Well, 
Let's get that robot behind bars. Mm -hmm. Well, in other YouTube legal news, they have sued a fellow by the name of Christopher L. Brady. And like we said, they seem to be the good guys in this lawsuit. And you may remember a few months back in January when two Minecraft YouTubers, Abby Raids and Kenzo, shared stories of the same person making false copyright claims on their videos and then demanding a ransom payment to prevent further copyright strikes. It was a high-profile example of the kind of extortion that happens fairly often on YouTube. And it turns out, in addition to YouTube removing the strikes after enough public attention, they're now looking to make an example out of the guy who did all this, which is good. Yeah, when we see examples of this sort of copyright strike extortion, we generally assume that the people doing it live in some other part of the world where it would be basically pointless to try to take them to court. But it turns out that this Christopher Brady dude is an American who lives in Nebraska, so mm. whoops. And uh, in addition to the Abby Raids and Kenzo incidents, he allegedly tried the stunt several other times with other YouTubers for several more months. In uh, June and July, he apparently went after a YouTuber whose name we can only assume is pronounced Calvin. And uh, this guy actually decided to try the formal process to dispute the claims. A lot of people don't bother with that because it opens you up to being sued in court. But in this case, Calvin was fully confident that he hadn't violated any copyright laws. Unfortunately, when you do a counter notice, you also have to provide your real name and address. And according to Calvin, a few days after issuing those, uh, the counterclaims, he got swatted. Huh. So the swatting itself may be difficult to prove in court, but YouTube says they have strong evidence that Chris Brady was responsible for the fraudulent takedown notices and that they were able to trace uh, at least 15 different online identities tied to this extortion back to him. So it sounds like Christopher Brady may be totally fucked here. And in addition to financially ruining him and making other would-be extorters think twice, hopefully law enforcement is looking into the connections that could belong to that swatting incident. Yeah, because so. that could get him in prison. For a long time. Yeah. Well, fuck this guy. I yes. hope uh, hope the worst things happen to him. Yes. Uh, moving on now to some news about a seemingly clever plan going horribly wrong for the person trying it. Uh, recently, a man known as the, in the hacking community as Drugi held a presentation at the DEF CON hacking conference in Las Vegas, where he told the story of how, in order to avoid parking tickets, he had ordered a vanity plate for his car, which simply reads, NULL. All you programmers know what null means. Hmm. The idea was that now, when parking enforcement tried to ticket him, the DMV's computer systems would simply treat those tickets as if there were no data in the license plate field. Therefore, no ticket. Mm -hmm. This, however, did not work and ended up having the opposite effect. Yeah, Drugi not only received parking tickets for actual parking violations he'd committed, but also began receiving invoices for every single other ticket in the California DMV system where the license plate field had been left empty, adding up to over $12,000 in fines. Uh, he was able to get those fines removed, but was told by both the DMV and LAPD that unless he changed his license plate, he was just going to continue receiving parking, ticket, <laughs> parking tickets in the mail. Uh, what do you want us to do about it? But he refuses to change it, at least for now. So, I don't know. I mean, it's a cool story. Yeah. And this is not the first time that something like this has happened. Uh, another LA resident back in the late 1970s requested a vanity plate, and the way it works back then was you'd submit your top three choices to the DMV in case any of them were already taken. So he put sailing, and then he put boating, and since he didn't have a third pick, he just put no plate. So he ended up with no plate, and over the years received thousands of parking tickets in the mail. Wow. Uh, he, too, refused to change his plate, and instead he just kept a stack of form letters that he would mail back to the DMV whenever he received a ticket in the mail. Because, again, it's a great story. The worst thing that could ever happen to a, a, a local government is having someone with way too much time on their hands, ready <laughs> yeah. to fight everything that you fuck them over with. Yeah. They don't like it. Uh, the, same, the same thing has happened in various parts of the country as well to people whose vanity plates read no tag, no tags, uh, like a bunch of X's, or NV, which is apparently the parking enforcement code for not visible. And back in 2015, a guy whose real legal name is Christopher Null wrote an op-ed in Wired about how difficult it was for him to do basically anything in the digital age because putting his last name in most last name fields just led to error messages, though apparently he figured out that adding a period after Null solves all of his problems. So maybe they, uh, he should just switch the license plate to that. Yeah. Oh, I don't know if you can put periods on a license plate. Mm -hmm. Just draw it on with a little yellow pen. Yeah. We got him. Yes. Anyways, that's it for this week's Tech News Day. Very hot. I'm going to go take the ice bucket challenge. <laughs> yeah. Uh, thank Not you for, for ALS, us. for me. We are live after our two conspiracy theory videos, which you can watch over here. Uh, stay tuned for more videos this week. And we'll, uh, I think we're, we'll do a podcast later in the week. We were in Vegas yesterday, so... We'll, we'll, we'll get back to it. Don't worry. Yeah. It'll come out. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.